Hey guys! Yeah, I know it's been a little bit since my last video, but I've gone back to work full time and I'm also doing a play where I'm portraying four characters and they're all men. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's just get right into it and let's talk about Cinema Italiano. The first films produced in Italy were documentaries where the subject matter was current events and celebrities mostly kings, emperors, and popes. An early pioneer was Filotio Alberini, an ex-cartographer of the Military Geographic Institute of Florence. And with my other videos on foreign cinema, if I mispronounce anything, I do apologize. The first Italian film whose title is unknown was made in 1896 and depicted the visit of King Umberto and Queen Margherita in Florence. Unfortunately, most of the film has been lost, but there are still some traces today showing Pope Leo XIII going to pray in the Vatican Gardens and then turning to the camera for what is the first papal blessing to be filmed. Starting in 1803, several production companies were established in major cities, such as Rome, Milan, and Naples. Turin was the top production center in Italy with five production companies. The first narrative films were based on Italian dramatic tradition. Starting in 1905, the Roman Cinema's production house produced several historical costume films, later called peplums, which became the most popular genre of Italian cinema at the time. The first of such films was The Fall of Rome, directed by Alberini. Film Ambrosio, driven by the success of these movies, produced Mario Cassarini's The Last Days of Pompeii in 1913. It was a blockbuster with great visual effects for the time that recreated the volcanic eruption itself, with crowd scenes in an atmosphere of terror. Following this movie's success, many other historical movies were produced, basically retelling every major story of ancient Rome and the Italian Renaissance, many with mythological themes. They were also inspired by the success of the French art film movement. In particular, Film Italia, owned by Giovanni Pastroni, produced a series of art films starting in 1910 with the movie The Fall of Troy. After the success of The Fall of Troy, Giovanni Pastroni began producing an even more ambitious movie called Cabiria. It ran for a then unheard of length of two and a half hours, with fantastic settings derived from the most spectacular opera productions. The most important innovation was the decision to forego the fixed single camera and instead use numerous cameras and offer different views within the same scene. This marked a breakthrough in movie technique. Cabiria premiered in cinemas in 1914 and was an instant hit. It forever changed the language of movies and highly influenced many American filmmakers such as the legendary D.W. Griffith. In 1914, society dramas emerged and these movies became vehicles for Italian film actresses. After World War I, American and European competition almost destroyed the Italian industry completely, forcing productions to drop from 220 films in 1920 to less than a dozen in 1927, just before the introduction of talkies. In 1930, Gennaro Raielli directed the first Italian talking picture, The Song of Love. However, the emergence of talkies led to stricter censorship by the fascist government. During the 1930s, light comedies known as Telefoni Bianchi were prominent in Italian cinema. These films featured lavish sets, conservative values, and respect for authority, and thus typically avoided scrutiny from the government censors. In 1934, the Italian government created the General Directorate for Cinema and appointed Luigi Freddi its director. With the approval of Benito Mussolini, this directorate called for the establishment of a town southeast of Rome completely devoted to cinema, which became Cinecitta, which means Cinema City. Completed in 1937, the Cinecitta provided everything necessary for filmmaking, theaters, technical services, and even a cinematography school, the Experimental Center for Cinematography. The Cinecitta Studios were Europe's most advanced production facilities and greatly boosted the technical quality of Italian films. Many famous films were shot in Cinecitta, such as the 1959 Academy Award-winning epic Ben-Hur. Italian films made in the fascist period were often nationalistic and patriotic. In an important manifesto published in 1933 called The Glass Eye, Pro-Mussolini journalist Leo Longanesi called for Italian directors to take their cameras to the streets and produce a realistic version of Italian everyday life. A blend of fact and fiction sparked a new era of Italian cinema and became the formula for successful films about the war. Italian neorealism is regarded as the beginning of the golden era of Italian cinema. 
Neorealism was a movement aimed to provide an unadulterated window into the harsh truths that artists observed around them. Filmmakers made it a point to never use sets, but real settings with real people to further this effect. They would also hire untrained, non-professional actors in secondary and sometimes major roles to capture the sense of realism. Films of this era often focused on themes of poverty, classism, and living under an authoritarian regime, and the effects of war and post-war society. Many people consider Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City as the first fully realized vision of neorealism. Rossellini was not only one of the founders of the Italian neorealist movement in film, but he's also considered to be the father of Italian cinema. Rome Open City won the grand prize at Cannes, and a young Federico Fellini was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay at the 19th Academy Awards. The film features shocking scenes of torture, abuse, and violence to show the immediate after effects of the Nazi occupation of Rome. Perhaps the most famous Italian neorealist film is Vittorio De Sica's 1948 film Bicycle Thieves. The film received an honorary Oscar and was voted by the Academy Board of Governors as the most outstanding foreign language film to be released in the United States. The movie tells the story of a delivery man and his son on a quest to find a stolen bicycle. The simplistic story explored complex issues of classism in the post-World War II era. During the 1950s, neorealist films were becoming less and less popular with Italian filmgoers. The Italian government also encouraged filmmakers to move away from political themes that were prominent in neorealist films in order to compete with Hollywood. Therefore, musicals, comedies, dramas, and action films were favored at the box office. During the first half of the 1950s, comedies gave audiences a sense of relief to their challenging lives in the post-war period. By the mid to late 50s, sword and sandal epics thrived, beginning with 1958's Hercules. Italian director Pietro Francisci hired American bodybuilder and actor Steve Reeves to play the lead role. The film was a worldwide hit and a sequel, and many similar epics ensued. In the next decade, sword and sandal films were followed closely by spaghetti westerns. In the 1960s, Italian filmmakers reinvented the most quintessential of American genres. Stripping the form of its romantic patriotism and replacing it with bare-bones brutality and satire, the Spaghetti Western incorporated widescreen framing, sweaty close-ups, and expressive sound design, changing the way Westerns looked, sounded, and felt. And unlike most films, Spaghetti Westerns were easy to export given their minimal dialogue. Going into the 1970s, a different depiction of violence emerged through Italian giallo horror films. Its founder and most renowned filmmaker of the genre, Dario Argento, made the first giallo film, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, in 1970. His films feature brutally unique deaths and use electronic music from the Italian progressive rock band Goblin. Argento's most famous film is Suspiria, about an American ballet student who transfers to a prestigious dance academy in Germany, only to find out the academy is not what it seems. Through the 1980s and early 1990s, Italian cinema began to decline. Although Italy won Best Foreign Language Oscars for 1988's Cinema Paradiso and 1991's Mediterraneo, more Italians were going to the movies to see Hollywood productions rather than their own. Commercial broadcast networks began buying films and television shows from the U.S. and other countries, so Italian filmgoers had entertainment brought straight to their households. This is much like how streaming services are affecting the box office today you know, before everything happened. It wasn't until Life is Beautiful that Italy had major success at home. The film tells the story of a Jewish man protecting his son from the horrors of the Holocaust, pretending it's all a game. This film combined neorealism, surrealism, and the physical comedy likeness of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. But the film is also very heart-wrenching. If you need a good cry, I suggest watching this movie. I mean, it's, it's also an amazing movie, but it hits you in the heartstrings like a truck. Up until this time, Sofia Loren was the only actor to win an Oscar in a leading role solely in Italian. Life is Beautiful won three Oscars, including Best Foreign Language Film, Best Score, and Roberto Benigni became the second person to win a leading actor Oscar for a performance in Italian. Going into the new millennium, Italy started to see a rebirth of its film industry, and more Italian citizens were seeing local productions. It also saw more international success with films such as Gomorrah and Il Divo. These movies had themes of national identity, crime, 
immigration, and the family structure. In 2016, Variety magazine asked filmmakers and film critics at the Venice Film Festival if the Italian industry was in a rut. Critic Giona Nazaro said, The problem is not so much the state of Italian cinema at present, but the state of those who cover it in the media and also produce it, and continue to be in the state of mourning as if great Italian cinema no longer exists. Italy has the most wins for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards, and even though Italian cinema is far from its peak, many filmmakers are determined to keep the industry alive and prosperous in the future. All right, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. And if you have any questions or comments or criticisms, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content from me, please subscribe. And again, I hope everyone is staying safe and I hope that you are doing well and I will see you guys next time. Bye.